Welcome everyone, thank you for joining. Today I'm going to talk to you about building an MVP within data platforms, uh, how you can do this quickly, how you can do this easily, um, and how it really doesn't have to be hard. Um, a few things, if you Google data platform MVP, you will get the Microsoft most valuable professional stuff. That is absolutely not what this is about. Uh, by MVP, this is the minimum viable product in a data platform. The reason I put this talk together is I've seen a few times throughout my career data platform pro projects that fail for various reasons. I've also led data platform projects that have succeeded and that have failed. So you should hopefully learn some stuff on what to do, what not to do, and everything around it. Okay, cool. So standard disclaimers apply. Um, everything I say here is my view and my view only. It doesn't reflect my employer in any way. So when I say bad things, when I upset people, it's on me. Um, I have really strong opinions on things. I've been doing this a while and I am very, very jaded. Um, however, I'm often wrong. If I am wrong, please uh, tell me, tell me the Q&A, challenge me on things. Um, I will change my mind if you are correct. Um, yeah, let's move on. So who am I? What do I do? Where am I from? All that fun stuff. Um, I currently work at Hacker Job as a senior data platform engineer. I've been here about nine months now. I was the first hire into data here. Um, I've done data jobs for about 10 years. The last five have been in startups. Um, I've had the lucky job on, this is the third occasion now, where I've been able to join a company and build data from scratch, which means a lot of the challenges I'm going to talk about here, I've had to solve on my own more than once. Um, I find it really difficult to describe what my job is to people that don't work in tech, and even sometimes to those that work in tech. I like to think that I do data stuff. Um, I've been an analyst, a DBA, a dev, a data engineer, I've even dabbled in data science, even though I'm rubbish at it. Um, my kids say that I, I do numbers on the computer, if that helps. But effectively, if there's a job in data in a startup, I've probably done it at some point or another. So I want to give everyone a bit of an optimism quota. Um, there's a big thing at the moment in data with job titles, and they have just gotten absolutely out of hand and bizarre and weird. Um, we can't seem to decide what anything is called, and we seem to change our minds every three to six months on what any job is called across the entire data organization. So... We've invented new job titles recently, like analytics engineer, which I'm of the opinion DBT invented to sell more products. We've also taken traditional roles like ETL developer and called them data engineers. Um, the reality is your job title means absolutely very little. And in startups, it, it's effectively meaningless. Um, while it's anecdotal, I have had CTOs who do not who didn't know what Docker was and didn't know what a container was. Um, for anyone that's non-technical, that's like an artist not knowing how to use an easel. Um, I've also hired junior developers who are better at writing code than I will ever be. Um, fixating on job titles within data is at best an exercise in ego. It doesn't actually get us anywhere. Let's just say we all do data stuff and move on from there. So it then leads us on to what, what is a data platform? What is this thing we're talking about? What does it do? How did it come about? And effectively, it's a rebrand of stuff. So if we go back 10 years, uh, data still existed. People still did data. They used a different stack back then, whereas what we have now, you would call the modern data stack. Back then, it was it was almost a Microsoft-dominated market. If you were going to do data, which was at the time, 10 years ago, primarily business intelligence, you would use Microsoft packages, SSIS, SSRS, and you would have typically something like SQL Server 2008 R2. You still had data warehouses. You still had ELT. You still had ETL. You still had dashboards. You still had APIs. You still had data scientists. Kind of, we've decided instead of having lots and lots and lots of disparate concepts, we've just created this idea of a data platform. Um, what I need to be really clear on is that data platforms are specific to the business that you work for. So for some businesses, a data platform is a data warehouse with a reporting layer sat on top and an ETL layer at the back end. And that's all it is. For other businesses, a data platform may be doing stream processing. It may be doing stateful stream processing. For some, for some companies, it does a bit of everything. For some companies, it's very simple. For the rest of this talk, we are going to be primarily looking at batch systems, um, simply because batch will solve upwards of 90% of your data problems. And because we're talking about building out an MVP, you don't, if you're building out an MVP for a streaming system, the, the methods I'm going to talk about here aren't any good. Don't hack it together in a few days. It takes a lot more thought and costs a lot more money to do. However, batch processing, you can MVP extremely quickly and extremely cheaply, which is what we're going to talk about. 
So this is a diagram I stole from Amazon. I didn't do it myself. Um, like with everything, Amazon probably are better than me at it. Um, it gives you a high level view of what a data platform is and what it looks like and what it does. You effectively have a set of data sources. This can be anything. In a, in a, a small SaaS startup, you are typically talking things like Salesforce APIs, um, a production database from a web app, maybe some internal tooling, maybe some Google Sheets, maybe an S3 bucket, fairly standard stuff. You have a way to get your data in, which is your ingestion section. Um, that can be through a stream, that can be through batch. Typically, this is through an ETL tool, either one that you build yourself or one that you buy. You have a place where your data lives. This is typically a data warehouse in most data platforms, although not always, there are exceptions to this. You have processing, which is where you are doing your stuff to your raw data. And then you have your analytics layer, giving people what they want. And the most important thing when you're doing anything around this whatsoever, going all the way back to the beginning here, when we are getting to our MVP, we need to understand what the problem is that we are solving for the business that we work for. So if you if you are lucky enough, like I have been, to get jobs where you get to come in and build data platforms, you need to know what you are trying to fix. Going into smaller startups, some really typical problems would be all of our reports are in Google Sheets. We want them all in one place. Uh, we want a source of truth for reporting. We want to automate all of our reporting internally. Um, Dave from accounts runs our reports once a month. We can never, and we save a copy of them to Excel because we can never run our numbers historically. Or we have a data science team and they've made an absolute horrific mess. We need someone to come in and rationalize what they built and build a platform to run their models on. Enterprise companies are very different. Um, and enterprise companies are typically not looking to quickly build an MVP in this space. So we're not going to focus on building something out at enterprise scale. We are talking very much small business, go in, build a minimum platform that works. Because we're building a minimum platform, we're going to not build some stuff. We're not worrying about logging. We're not worrying about metadata. And we're looking to solve one user problem. You're not going to try and solve every problem at once. You're not going to promise people an all singing, all dancing, I will fix your stuff platform. You're going to solve one problem end to end. And then you're going to, exp then you're going to expand to other use cases from there. As well as that, we're going to keep it simple. Um, confession time, I, I use my wife as a sounding board because when I am wrong, she will just straight up tell me that I'm wrong. You need to find someone in your life that will do that for you. Long-term partners are great for it because they will just call you, you know, they will call you names when you're being silly. But find someone who will, who, who can do this for you. You need a sounding board. You need to be able to explain it to someone who is semi-technical in a way that they can understand. If you can't explain it to someone semi-technical, it's far too complex. If you can't explain it to an engineer, you've gone very far off piece and you just need to rip up your design and start again. Um, mainly, if you can't explain it, you don't understand it. You might think you do, you don't. If you can't explain it to someone semi-technical, it's too complicated. Semi-technical users don't care how stuff works. Most of your end users are not engineers. Most people that you are built that want access to data in a business, they may be able to like do a pivot table or play around with data in Excel. They don't care about architecture. They just don't care. I've fallen into this trap a few times thinking my users care about technical design and really care about arguing about how GRPC is significantly better than REST. And I do believe that we can argue about it later. Um, or how like you could use Kappa or Lambda architecture. They don't care. They, they just don't care. All that they want is their data set on a cadence that they that they need it. They may just want a data set once a week on an email. They may want a reporting dashboard they can get what they want from. They may want a CSV every hour in S3 to retrain a, a data science model on. What they don't care about is the underlying mechanism of it. So you need to be able to explain how and when they're going to get their data without going into silly technical details. And you need to understand how it's going to work. And that's why we keep our plans simple and we solve one use case at a time. We don't try and do loads of stuff at once. So taking all that into account, we have some stuff that we need in order to make a data platform work. So we have, first of all, we need to know where we're getting our data from. So if we are to build out a I don't know, reporting dashboard for finance, you would be getting probably your data from Salesforce API. You need to know how you're gonna move that data, what gets you that data, how you change that data into something usable, where you're going to store that data and how you're going to serve that data. And then you need a plan. So from experience, the biggest mistakes that every project are made at the beginning, the hardest things to change in every project happen at the beginning. It's where you make that key incorrect architecture choice. It's where you make those assumptions that are just wrong. And then you have to try and fix it three months later. And it's 
it, it just hurts. It's just painful and kills your time. You really need to get a good understanding of what problem you are solving. And I know I've said this a few times, but it's the biggest pitfall I've seen in data platforms. You need to know what problem your platform solves before you write a single line of code. So we have to go to a, a bit more of a controversial point, kind of, which is build versus buy. Everyone has an opinion on this. Every engineer wants to build everything themselves because first of all, it's just fun. Um, second of all, we're engineers. We like building stuff. Third of all, there's an, an illusion of control with self-built systems. To give you some examples here, if you take an ETL system, which we'll talk about later, you can build it yourself. You, you can absolutely go out and build everything. You could use a library like Singer. You can build an ETL system yourself. I've done it in a startup before. The problem is it's really fun to do. It's a great project. You then have to build and maintain that. If you're building an MVP and you're one of a few data employees in a company, you're on your own. You don't have someone you can just offload this project to. And all of a sudden, you're no longer working in Greenfield because you have maintenance and you have monitoring and you have logging. There's always trade-offs. You can, in theory, build any part of a data platform yourself. You can even design your own data warehouse platform if that's what you really want to do. The reality is it's better off buying stuff. And as a disclaimer, I am going to talk about products in this talk. Some of you might know what they are. Some of you will have different opinions to me on these products. That's okay. Some of them fit MVPs. Some of them don't. Um, second of all, building stuff in-house. Uh, I have been down this rabbit hole, and it is a rabbit hole. Um, if you are a in a very small data team, you are a alone or one of two or three engineers, building and maintaining every single part of the data stack yourself as custom code is the road to pain and drinking and burnout. And it's just not fun. I strongly do not advise doing this. So moving on to our parts. First of all, we need to understand where we're getting our data from. And this is weirdly the part you'll probably spend the longest doing analysis on. So going back to the original example of someone wanting dashboards based on Salesforce data, Salesforce data is very well documented. Their APIs are very clear on what they do. Their data structure is very standard. That's really nice and easy to work with. And you can move through this phase quite quickly if you're working with very much a structured API data return as your MVP. If for your MVP, you are replicating a production database, this could be very easy or very hard, but this is the part you really need to understand. Otherwise, you can't move quickly. So common pitfalls I've seen when you join early stage companies that want you to work on their data is that they themselves have built their main app as an MVP and then just bolted bits on. They will have, they won't be in microservices. So you're only replicating one instance, but this one instance will have loads of old data in, names make no sense, date formats are mismatched, typing doesn't work. Um, and you need to know all of this. Otherwise getting your data to your end users becomes impossible. And you want to know this before you start speaking to vendors and looking at products that you want to use because as we'll get towards the end there's a trick to do this very cheaply that involves abusing trial periods we want to know what we need to do before we start trial periods so with this spend a good amount of time understanding what your input data looks like how you're going to use that data just clone the database psql onto it have a play look at tables get a good understanding if it's a structured api that's great that's significantly easier but this is where you really need to get an understanding of data from a core system and deliver deliver some value with an, with an MVP. Um, second of all, we, we need to move our data. So Singer was the original library for this. It was released by Stitch, I think in 2008 or 2009, quite a long time ago. Um, St Singer itself, it's an incredibly simple library to use. Any developer with any experience can pick it up really easily. It allows you to create taps and targets and move data between two things. For example, you can tap a Postgres database with a target of S3, and you can run that job on your machine. The problem is you have to run this somewhere. And the second problem is that when Talend acquired Stitch, they kind of stopped support, supporting Singer in the way that they used to. It's not as great as it used to be. In reality, standing up your own ELT platform for an MVP is... Oh, I wouldn't advise it. You can do it. it. It is a thing you can do, but it adds a significant amount of time that you need to spend. And what you want with an MVP is to move quickly. You want to be getting stuff out the door and understanding how things work end to end. And you want to try and get away from having to build and maintain platforms to do something you can do quite cheap through a vendor, which moves us on nicely. We're talking about vendors. Um, in this space, you are swamped for options. And I really, really, really do mean swamped. Um, on this page are some vendors I have used. Um, Fivetran and Stitch are SaaS ETL platforms. Sorry, they're not. They are Extract, 
and load platforms. They don't do your transform. They will take data from a, any raw source you want and load it to another database. Nice and easy. They both have the problems. Both of them are missing certain connectors. So some of them only work with certain data sources. For example, Stitch will work with close IO, Fivetran won't. Neither of them work, will work with uh, BigQuery. You have to use Airbyte for that. Gets messy, right? Not every product does everything. Um, Airbyte, you can pay them as a SaaS product or alternatively, you can host it yourself. And you might think, great, I can just host it myself. That'll be great. And self-hosting is great until it's not. Eventually, what you're going to find with the standard Airbyte instructions is that box out of memories because they have a memory leak and a core library still in their release version to this date. And as well as that, any kind of larger job will nuke a self-hosted Airbyte instance. So it's great. It may work for an MVP, but you've got to think, do I want to be standing up? Do I want to be running containers with Docker images in, managing secrets, managing credentials, managing infrastructure? Or do I want to take out a five tran two week free trial just to prove that something works? We'll talk more on that. We'll talk more about that at the end. The other options you have if you want to build it yourself and use something like Singer, um, you can run an Airflow, which is the classic, which everyone in data engineering has worked with. It's been the market leader for some time. You have up and coming platforms. So Mage is the one I've listed on here because I, I truly think in three months' time, Mage will be ready to take over from Airflow. It's not there yet. It's very promising. It genuinely is a fantastic product, just needs a bit of work. Um, and finally, you have Fabric, which is Microsoft's offering. Again, it's brand new. If it's anything like normal Microsoft products, it will be about 50% good, 50% bad. And if you can only buy the good bits, it's probably worth looking at. At the end, this is a pick your poison question. Um, it's build versus buy all the way down. Self-hosting stuff is really good until it's absolutely not. Um, costs in this can be really high. The way ETL tools work is they charge you per row that they move. So for example, if you do a database migration and you migrate, I don't know, 100 million rows inside of your main app, and that gets picked up by an ETL tool, you're going to be billed for 100 million rows, even though they, they provide no business value. You've got to trade in the end. You were talking control versus cost versus time. You lose control, you pay some money, you gain loads of time, or you can build it all yourself, and it's going to cost you a lot of time, a little bit of not much money, and you gain a lot of control. It's entirely up to you, and this needs to fit your business case. So Transforming data is, um, there's really only one thing to use. And I don't like that personally. I think there needs to be a competitor product to DBT because they are, they have pretty much complete dominance of the market at this, at this spot. And that's not good for innovation. That aside, however, DBT Core, which is their free to use open source library is fantastic. Can't really knock it too much. DBT Cloud, however, for an MVP, just, just don't bother. It, it's a waste of money. Um, you can run this in GitHub Actions and it will just run DBT against your chosen data warehouse. So when you are building an MVP, you don't want to lock in any vendor contracts um, because you may not go down this route. This MVP, maybe the business may simply say, no, we're not doing this. This doesn't work for us. They won't if you do it right. But there's a good, you know, there's always a risk there. You don't lock in the vendors. So what you're looking to do here is just create an EC2 instance to run this on or just allow the GitHub runners to run against your database if, if you're comfortable doing that. And DBT can just run again. You can run DBT through GitHub Actions. Um, you can run all your CI, CD through here. So we run our DBT tests, our DBT docs. Um, any pre-merge checks are all around with GitHub Actions. And we have our DBT run scheduled through GitHub Actions as well. Um, it takes you out of a vendor locking contract. You have complete control over it. And it's GitHub, so you, you don't really have to worry too much about security with it. Next, we talk about storing data. So you've pulled your data out of a core system. You know how you're going to transform it. You know you know what your core system is. It needs to live somewhere. Um, I have no commercial affiliation with this company, but if you can get the budget for it, just pay for Snowflake. It, it It's so far ahead of the competitors at this point, it's almost embarrassing. However, it is pricey. And again, for an MVP product, you might not be able to get sign off to do it. They do offer a free trial, which we can use to, to get around this for an MVP. Um, but th their product is fantastic. If you are going to go down the route of building a data platform, I would just recommend Snowflake. And if anyone from Snowflake is on the call, let's talk later. Um, if you can't do that, you should effectively pick the warehouse product that is on your existing infrastructure. So if your company is running an AWS, you should use Redshift. If it's running an Azure, use their version, their flavor of SQL, whatever it is. If you are on GCP, run BigQuery. Um, it just makes things significantly simpler. 
um, within your infrastructure because you're just matching what already is there. Now, if you can't get sign off for any of these things, and there are worlds where that can happen, where budgets are absolutely tiny, you can build a data warehouse on Postgres if you really want to do it. You could use MySQL. You could use SQLite. I mean, any database could, in theory, do this. I'd say don't go down the NoSQL route. That that would be very odd. But any relational database, in theory, could, could hold your data for an MVP. Finally, we move on to giving users what they want, which is comfortably the hardest part of this, um, partly because users often don't know what they want, uh, but also because this is such a varied question, I can't really give any guidance on it. If we take our original starting point, if we have a user who wants their Salesforce data, that's fairly easy to do. They would effectively require an Excel export or a certain data or a dashboard that they can play with. Nice and easy. If you have data scientists, they may just simply want the ability to query a data warehouse to get their data without having to run data science workloads on the main production application. Again, that's reasonably easy. You will know what you need to do here if you've planned correctly. If you get to this point and you've built an ELT system and you have a warehouse with data in, you have DBT running, you have a product like Fivetran in place, and you don't know what your users want, uh, you've just failed. It, it's a failed project. This should be the most important part of what you do. You should be building everything, knowing what you're going to serve your users. Um, unfortunately, the world where there's free money seems to be over. So now spend is really important. We have to justify the business value we give within data. So we need to know what our users want. However, seeing as I have done this a few times, some, some tips. Um, first of all, everyone hates Excel that works in data. Every data engineer, data scientist, data analyst, analytics engineer, as soon as they get off Excel, they develop this, this hatred towards it. For good reason, it's got loads of problems. However, it is the most successful piece of business software ever created. I, I hate that that's true, but it is true. Um, the first thing you need to do is give users the ability to get their data in Excel because the first thing they want to want to do is play with their data. So regardless what you think you are building, if it involves a dashboard, it needs an export to Excel button, or that will be the first feature that you get requested. Second of all, you really need to be really clear with what you are doing as a platform. You are not a BI team. You are not a dashboarding team. The platform that you build supports a dashboarding team. You're not there to build business critical dashboards all day, every day. If you interview for a, for a platform job and one of the main things that you are doing is building stuff in Looker, don't take the job. It's not a platform job. It's a disguised analytics job. Be very clear what your role is and support and help where it's needed. So if you're in a small startup, do some dashboarding, sure. Don't spend all week doing it. There's far more value in providing a platform than there is in building dashboards. So finally, then you need a plan. Talking through all of our example, using our fictitious company with our fictitious end users, let's just imagine we want to get our data from a, a Django web app that sits on Postgres. The way I would approach this, knowing that my end users simply want their data at the end of every month and the ability to get the previous few months data for the same set of reports, I would first of all map all of my data that I have here. I would then work out exactly what code I need to write in DBT before I do anything else. I would write my transformations. You can mock this data up, you can build it locally, and you can write transformations to know exactly what you want. I would then, assuming I can't get a trial on Snowflake because I can't get any money, I would then sign a two-week free trial with Fivetran as they will let you replicate your database for free in that trial period. I would use the data warehouse that's existing on the infrastructure that is already there in the company. So let's say... They, as they're a startup, they will probably be on AWS, hence why we're going to say we'll go with Redshift, which again, you can get very cheaply with the smallest possible instance. And then you would use something like Amazon QuickSight. You can stand up Fivetran, Redshift, and QuickSight in a day. You can get an MVP product together solving a really specific use case in a, a week or two's max. And most of that time is the analysis, understanding your users' problems, understanding how to get data to solve those problems and then gluing stuff together effectively. Anyway, that brings us to the end. It looks like we have some questions already. So I'm gonna hand back to Phil and thank you all very much. Thank you very much, Joe. That was awesome. That was awesome. Really, really interesting. Um, and as you said, we do have a couple of, of questions already. Um, I've made a few notes as well as I was going because yeah, like I said, very, very interesting topic to delve into. Um, so look, our first question is, how do you think tools will vary depending on the size of data in the company and, and kind of 
align to the data storage needs. So I suppose maybe not may, maybe not the size of the company, maybe the size of the data set, I suppose, is, is kind of what we're, we're aiming at. So the use case I talked about is an MVP in a smaller company. Now, as you grow with data volumes, you again, you need to be extremely clear on what problem you're solving. So as soon as you start moving from moving, you know, if you're moving gigabytes of data around, you can be a bit sloppy and a bit hacky. It doesn't cost you too much money. As soon as you're moving terabytes of data around, even just moving that data set, there's a much larger cost. The same tool set will work moving an extremely large relational database into a warehouse. It will just take longer. Um, and the reality is when you're moving that volume of information, there's always going to be a time lag. There's not, you can't do that. You're limited by physics in all honesty. You can't speed stuff up. The same tooling will work with extremely large data volumes, but the planning needs to be much more in depth. If you make mistakes with much larger data sets, it costs you a lot more money. So typically for an MVP, you're not going to be building out stuff on terabyte or petabyte size databases. It, if you make there's too much risk in there effectively fantastic thank you very much um and look, a bit of a question from me so i know look, the, the world of, of, of data platform and data architectures moved you know ridiculously quickly over the over the past kind of five ten years obviously we've gone from kind of etl logical replication now into kind of the world of of, of streaming and, and that sort of things like What's what's still frustrating what can't you do yet what which problem are you excited for someone to fix Okay, so I think one thing that frustrates me is the amount of hype and the big hype cycles that you get within data. So if we go back 10 years when I was first starting out, there was this big talk on big data. And it was only big if you didn't know what the adjective big meant. It, like we've, we, the, the year of big data doesn't really exist in many commercial companies and streaming itself is a, a solution that's often looking for a problem instead of a problem looking for a solution. A lot of people implement streaming patterns when you absolutely don't need them and they add complexity in the data that doesn't drive any real value. Um, what I'm excited about, so there's obviously all the hype around large language models. I don't think it's going to go the way people think it is. Um, we actively use um, language model tools at Hacker Job already. I, I use GitHub Copilot every single day. One of the problems that we have and that we've had for a very long time is that you will have people who want to query a database but don't want to learn SQL. Um, they don't want to go out, they, they, they just don't have the time, think senior product managers, execs. And traditionally, we've had those questions answered by analysts building them dashboards and building reports. If there is a way to, for them to be able to ask a question in natural language and get an, a correct answer from a database, I think the first company that solves that, and there's dozens of companies working on it, none of them work properly. The first company that solves that has basically made a money printer. Fantastic. Excellent. So yeah, anyone out there? listening uh you know looking for that that next big opportunity it's, it's still out there someone's uh, is waiting for someone to crack it so no thank you so much joe um we have another question come in so different users even within a, a cohort might may suggest different needs and wants um how have you found kind of managing this is an important part of the process kind of yeah balancing those different okay, needs cool. and different users so for an MVP, you should pick one problem. Um, and that's often, you, you determine that internally within the business. What's the most either, and you have to balance two things. The most important problem may not be easy to solve. So you're looking for something that has a balance of, it has a big business impact, but you can solve it quite quickly. Once you have your initial problem set and you've solved the business on purchasing a lot of stuff, that's when you can start to add in extra wants and needs. And that's where you need to manage a data platform as a product. You're not a service team, you're not a reporting team, you're not a data team, you are a product, an internal product. So you will build out features exactly the same way that you would build out features within software. So there's a realignment that's happened within data recently where data has moved from being a, hey, data team, make me a report on finance. Hey, data team, make me a report on HR. That model is dying a death, if not has died in a lot of places. The model is now data team provides capabilities for people to build on. Um, and in my opinion, moving data into being a product, a positive change, because it was very much a master servant relationship for quite a while. Nowadays, it's not that at all. Fantastic. Excellent. Um, wanted to touch on quickly, you know, on the language side of things. Obviously, you know, Python is, is often talked about as the lingua franca for, uh, for data. What sort of languages do you use in your kind of day-to-day -day role? And, and do you have a preference or I suppose there's different use cases, right, for different languages? Yeah, so you're right. Python is, is the standard language in data for a lot of things. Um, various reasons. It's very quick to learn, in all honesty. It's very easy to get things stood up really quickly in it. Um, SQL is the other language you will write a lot of if you work in data. It's been around for a long time. Even learning 1970s flavor SQL is still relevant today. It's not going anywhere and neither is Python. Python hits performance problems. So 
eventually you will get to the point where if you work in an organization with very large data sets, Python starts to break down. Um, it doesn't do threading very well in the slightest. It doesn't do concurrency at all. It's just terrible at concurrency. They're trying to fix that with changes to the global inter interpreter lock. That's not happened yet. In fact, that's coming out soon, thinking about it. As soon as you need to deal with concurrent operations, you're going to start hitting problems with Python and you might want to start looking at a language that's better at concurrency. And whenever you're looking at streaming, Python just falls apart. So there's a language, a, 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 sorry, wrong word. There's a library in Python called Faust, which was released by, I think it was one of the crypto companies. I can't remember which one. That can kind of work with Kafka. But in the past for dealing with streaming, I've just written my own libraries to do it and ended up moving languages to Scala to deal with streaming. Um, at Hacker Job, we use Golang as our second language. So for any particularly difficult data problems, I'll be writing them in Golang. But what you'll see is the vast majority of work is Python. Anything that's really high performance or streaming is typically in Scala or Java. Golang is starting to, to emerge um, and Rust is starting to make inways because everyone just likes it. Um, there's a really good blog from a guy, I can't remember his name, about basically doing data engineering in Rust, which is a really good read. Um, it's not there yet, but people are actively developing libraries to start making inroads. And it's just faster than everything else out there. So in, I would hope that's what we go towards. I don't think I'm right, though. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Um, and if you do think of that blog article, we can definitely include that in the email that goes out to everyone next week. Um, yeah, sounds like a great read for anyone that is interested in finding out a little bit more around, uh, you know, data platforming um, and everything that Joe has kind of talked us through in today's session. Um, Joe, is there anything we haven't had the chance to cover yet? Anything else at all you, you wanted to kind of tell the audience out there? Um, anything you didn't get the chance to cover in your, your, your actual talk? Uh, no, to be honest, I am. I chopped and changed a lot. Um, this is my second run through of it. So I think this one went a lot smoother than the first. Um, I'm happy to field any questions people have on data. If not, we're all good. Fantastic. Fantastic. Yeah, no, honestly, um, smooth. Uh, yeah, incredibly smooth talk. Um, yeah, really, really interesting. I think uh, definitely anyone out there who maybe isn't super well versed in the world of data will have still had a lot to to take away from it i think it was a yeah really nice balance of, of in-depth tech while also um you know lay, lay lay person speak um and yeah plenty for for everyone out there listening to, to take away so um we don't have any further questions uh coming in from the the audience so um we'll wrap things up there i hope everyone that has, has listened into uh, this afternoon session um, as I said, had lots to take away. The cogs are probably wearing. Uh, anyone who is in the, you know, the data platform world, I'm sure you picked up a few, few tips and a few interesting ideas that you want to go away and explore. So um, we'll let you crack on and uh, and go and explore those. Um, but look, first, uh, first and foremost, thank you so much, Joe. Um, thanks for joining us and taking us through uh, such an interesting talk.